of this chapter, we'll actually go into infinitely repeated games, which is not harder than the two here. Okay. So the stage game, usually if we play the same game over and over again, uh, we call this, you know, in any particular period, a stage game. So in this case, in this uh, two by three game, the stage game has two pure strategy match equilibrium. One is BY, and the other one is AZ. Okay. So notice that BY and AZ uh, are advantageous to one player. So who likes BY better? Player one. What about uh, AZ? Player two. Okay. Um, and we also notice that there's another outcome which is pretty well efficient, but is not a stage game match equilibrium because it's not a neutral best response if they somehow ended up here. So this is AX, right? If they end up here, player who has an incentive to unilaterally deviate? Two. Player two. Player two has an incentive to deviate one of the national. Equilibrium. This is why this is not equilibrium, but it's a nice outcome. It's very equitable, okay, almost equitable, and uh, it gives both player uh, good payoffs. In fact, this one pretty dominates this one. Um, okay, I should. Do that. I'm sorry. This is I'm using my laptop because the, the console has a bit of a problem. So random things might pop up. Um, so this one, AX actually pretty dominates BY, but if you only play it one shot, it's not a national equilibrium. Okay? You, you can't sustain this, and this is not a stable outcome. And so with two-period repetition, uh, what I'm trying to show, what I was trying to show last time, is that you, you can actually do it, at least for one period, okay? if you structure your strategy correctly. Um, so let's take a look at, um, the payoffs after we repeated for uh, two periods. Okay. So this is the, the, the graph. Okay, so the red dots is uh, everything that follows zero, zero, right? We have several outcomes with zero, zero payoff. So these four red dots are basically the stage game uh, payoffs. Okay. And then the black ones this, this, and this are the additional payoffs following 4, 3, or 2, 1. And the yellow ones are the additional payoffs following 1, 4, which is one of the national equilibrium. Um, so this is just a graphical representation of the space. So if we're only talking about one-shot games, we're restricted to looking at these four red dots. But if we expand to two-period repetition, um, the payoff space is much, very much enlarged. And where do we want to get to in terms of Pareto efficiency? Which is the Pareto frontier? Towards which side? Um, Sebastian. The uh, upper black one. Yeah, so we want to go to the northeast side, right? This is better for both players. And so and I, it would be nice to achieve something that we call on the Pareto frontier which is uh, the efficient outcomes for the two-period game. And let's take a look at uh, um, the sub perfect Nash equilibrium. Um, so we say that any sequence of stage game Nash equilibrium profiles can be supported as sub perfect. Right? So if we repeat the two stage game outcomes, uh, what are they? They are AZ and BY with repetition, right? So AZ gives you a payoff of 1, 4. If you play it twice, the payoff is, what is it? Drop 2, 8. Okay, so 2, 8 would be right here, right? So this is a sub-imperfect Nash equilibrium because by definition, when you're in the second stage, okay, you are playing a Nash equilibrium and then back off in the first stage, you're also playing a match Okay, so by definition, re repetition of stage game match is a stage game match What if we play BY twice, right? BY gives us a payoff of 2-1 for one period. What about two periods, Isaiah? 4-2. Uh, okay, 4-2. So we go here, 4-2. This is BY, okay? 
uh, that's also an equilibrium. Uh, what about this one? I also circled it. What is, what is the uh, equilibrium outcome here? How do we obtain this? Uh, mixing. mixing. So you can do, not, not in the sense of mixing, mixed strategies, but we can play BY in the first period and AZ in the second period, or vice versa, okay, in the first stage and second stage. So these are basically repeated play of the stage game Nash equilibrium. Um, and notice that this is actually pretty dominated by this outcome, and this one is also pretty dominated by this outcome. What is this? This gives us a payoff of five, uh, for the horizontal axis for player one and the payoff of seven for player two. And what this one is, is to play a non-equilibrium strategy, which is AX, right, in the first period. What is AX? AX is this outcome, right? this one, four, give you a payoff of four, three. So we play AX in the first period, and if uh, player two doesn't deviate from X, then we select AZ, otherwise we'll play BY in the second period. So this will give us um, a, a payoff of AX in the first period and AZ in the second period, if both players <coughs> listen okay, uh, to the prescription. Um, so, so this is nice because in the first period you're actually playing a pretty optimal set of strategies, even though it's not a national code. Uh, so next, what I'm going to do is to actually analyze whether this is, in fact, a sub-imperfect mesh okay. um, So before I do that, I will introduce a concept called reputational equilibrium. Okay. It's essentially uh, playing a non-stage gain Nash profile in the first period and then a stage gain Nash profile in the second period. So my question is why, if you have a two-stage game, why does the second stage strategy have to be a stage game Nash profile? Aaron. Is it because you're already in the second period? So yes. You have no choice. Uh, you have no choice. Um, our players always have lots of choices, okay? Um, but it's in their best interest to do so. So, anybody else who wants to um, continue this argument? Is it because um, in the second stage it's uh, equivalent to a one stage game? Yes. And so you play the natural. Exactly. So, well, the second period, in the second stage, it has to be the stage game natural because, remember, we're doing backward induction. So in the second stage, it has to be a natural equilibrium restricting to whatever part of the game the tree would have worked out. In particular, in the last, in the end game, in the last period, it has to be a mutualist response. And in this case, so the second stage has to be uh, a stage game match But what we're going to do um, is to make the second stage action contingent upon the outcome of the first stage. Okay, so this is the first time that we introduce history contingent strategies. We use history contingent strategies all the time. Um, you know, little kids understand that. You, if you take a, a five-year-old to the grocery store, they'll say, you know, I want the candy. No, no, it's really bad for you. If you don't buy it for me, you're not coming to my birthday party, right? So what is, what is that? That's a history contingent strategy. If you don't do this, I am not going to, I'm going to punish you in the future. That's essentially what it is. Yeah. What's history? What does history contingent mean? Uh, contingent means to depend on something. Okay, so history contingent. Mm. 
means that the action depends, the action is dependent on the past or past behavior. Okay. So if you don't behave today, I'm going to punish you tomorrow. So my strategy has a part which says, if you do this, then I will do that. Okay, so it depends on your your um, behavior. Okay. So um, so the second period action usually is contingent on the outcome in the first period. So whether a player or not. Okay. So in this case, we know that AX is really good because it's parental efficient and it's also fairly equitable. Okay. So we select AX in the first period. Okay. And if player two chooses X, we know that in this game, we don't have to worry about player one. When we try to look at whether this is an Ash equilibrium or not, whether we can actually enforce this AX or not, we know that it's not, um, we do not have to worry about player one. Why is that? Yen? We don't have to worry about player one in the first period. What is that? Choose. Why don't we have to worry about player one? Okay, because A is what? How are you? We have a term. We have a terminology for better for. What is it? Critica. <laughs> I'll go around the room until we find the term. Okay, the terminology. What is if player two chooses X? Why should player one choose A? Uh, Samantha. So player one is looking between four and zero. Mm -hmm. So the best response is like, That's it, best response. Okay. <laughs> Notice that I under, underlined the payoff four because it's the best response. Okay. What is a Nash equilibrium? Mutual best response. Mutual best response. Okay. It's not a Nash equilibrium because it's not a best response for player two. But it is the best response for player one already. So we know player one doesn't have an incentive to unilaterally do it. We don't have to worry about it, okay? The only thing we need to worry about is player two. So we know that player two has an incentive to jump over here, okay? If we say, let's play AX in the first period. So what we're, what we're going to do is to make use of the fact that there are two stage game Nash equilibrium, okay? One is something that player one likes. Player two likes. The other one is something that he doesn't like so much. Okay. So this is something that he likes, player two likes. So we say if you do this, if you play X, we will play A Z in the second period. And we know that is a mutual best response, so it's it's enforceable. But if you deviate, we are going to play D Y in the second period. Okay. Even though the two Nash equilibria are both each uh, self-enforcing, okay? Uh, players have preferences about which one they like better. So we, we basically exploit that fact, okay, to construct this repeated game strategy. Yes? Can you explain a situation in which that might happen? Because I understand the theory behind it, but I don't yeah. understand saying we're going to play BY unilaterally I mean, can't, can't be, like, no, never mind, that makes sense. Because one would always play B and then the second. Yeah, so one can stick with it and yep. say that, you know, I am going to play B, then what's your best response going to be? Your best response is to play B. Now, the strategy space is getting complex, so it's very natural if something that I just said doesn't make any sense to you. In that case, just ask. Okay? You're helping everybody by asking. 
Okay, so that's how we construct the repeated game Nash equilibrium. Okay, so um, so in a way, what you're doing is essentially you have you have a carrot and a stick. Okay, so. In the first period, we're selecting something that's pretty efficient, but it's not a Nash equilibrium. If you play, I will reward you in the second period. And if you don't, if you deviate and you cheat, I'm going to punish you. Okay. So that's how we construct this sequence of strategies, uh, where the first one is actually not a stage in Nash equilibrium, but the whole profile is a Nash equilibrium. And how do we know that it is a Nash equilibrium? Okay. And how do we know that why that that is something perfect? Um, in stage two, it's clear. Either way, okay, we're playing stage game Nash equilibrium, so it's a neutralized response. So we don't have to worry about uh, the incentive to deviate. No one has an incentive to deviate in stage two. What about stage one? In stage one, we, we analyze the fact that two has an incentive to unilaterally deviate if there's no future punishment. Okay. However, with future punishment, taking into account the stream of payoffs, um, two doesn't have an incentive to deviate in the first period. Okay. So if she plays X in the first stage, her payoff, total payoff will be seven. Okay. So she gets three in the first period and four in the second period. And if she deviates to Z in the first period, her total payoff is five. Where is five from? Four in the first period and one in the second period. So comparing seven and five, does she have an incentive to deviate? No. So it's very much like the King Solomon's dilemma example that we went through. We construct a pair and a stick the stick's actually never used in equilibrium. Okay, we don't observe the stick being used on the equilibrium path. So it's there for deterrence. Yes, Richard. Yes, uh, taking the same around, there's no future punishment for everyone, right? Right. So why the player one want, want to choose A, A, Z in the wrong queue? If I am player one, I, I will tell you I will choose B, Y, because there's no further punishment. Why does player one choose? Yes, like in the first period, uh, which is A, A X, right. which is uh, for three. Right. And in the second round, I can, I can say, I will choose B. And the best response for player two is choose Y. Yes. And there's no punishment. So why player one does not choose B in the second round, no matter what condition it is? Uh-huh. OK, so uh, that's a good question. Okay, it's basically talking about equilibrium selection. However, uh, what you want to what you want to notice is when we analyze whether a, whether a set of strategies is a national equilibrium strategy, you want to take the entire the two run two stage both for both stages into account. Uh, which says that given player two, if so notice that Nash equilibrium is a neutralized response, and that applies in the two-stage state as well. So the issue is, suppose player one follows the prescription. Does player two have an incentive to unilateral? And the key is unilateral. Okay. So player, suppose player one says, um, you're talking about player two, right? Or player one. Player one. Player one. Okay. So player one does not have an incentive to deviate in the first stage, given player two's actions. In the second stage, player one likes this better. But if there's no reward in the strategy profile, you can sustain choose, uh, two, two strategies. Okay. So they, they have to be mutual response. Who's moving first in this game? It's two simultaneous rounds. Oh, it's simultaneous? Yes. So it's simultaneous in one stage, and then you play this game again. Oh. Again, simultaneous. So lots of this coordination. But the strategies are announced ahead of time. Okay. So once it's announced, 
uh, it's in equilibrium if it is self-enforcing. Because like this would like, make sense like if there wasn't some opinions, right? Because that player one would actually be behaved in the second right, round. Right, right. Everything will be different if it's actually sequential. Okay. But, but, but so, if I am player two, yeah. uh, no matter I did, did it in the first one and whether I did it, but like, I choose X or Z. Uh, I understand that player one will choose B in the second round because I, I will not choose X and so the best responsible for player one should be should be two like BY. So And BY BY is a something perfect. Yes. Right. Yeah. What what I mean is like in the first round and player one choose A and so the, the result should be AX or A Z. So it's four three or one four. Okay, so let's let's say, analyze. Why don't you construct a complete instead of taking one part of the strategy part? Why don't you construct a complete strategy, which is what do your players do in the first stage? Okay, so let's say that we so you want them to play AX in the first stage, and then what happens in the second stage? So if I am player one, I will choose speed in any condition, no matter what player two. In the second stage. Yeah. But right now you are considering other people's, you are considering two period payoffs, right? Yeah. Not just your first period payoff. Okay, so stage two. So you're saying in stage two, um, here we should go for B. Okay. okay. So the question is, is this something perfect? Yeah. I mean, to, I think a different way of asking the question is, uh, why does player one have to be bound to the agreement? You know, so the, the contingency is on the behavior of player two. Mm -hmm. But what's stopping player one from deviating in stage two? Um, there's nothing that stops player one from deviating in stage two. That's why stage two would only put stage two in the Yes. Part of it, the, the player two is expecting player one to follow through with the strategy of now. Yeah. That player two will then choose, will always choose Z in the second round, who chose X in the first round. And thus player one will end up with zero, zero if they if they need Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so that's what that's So what so Nash equilibrium is always given the other people's strategy, given the other player's strategies, what's your best result? Because it was consecutive yeah. player one and player one chose B and player two chose two two Y, yeah. but player two is not gonna know if player one's choosing Z, but player one's choosing B. Okay, so so that's that's correct. So Jerusha's analysis is correct in the sense that if player one is following this the strategy, okay, so player one chooses X in the first period and Z in the second period. The question is, you know, his reasoning is, okay, we're following the path, and it is in my best interest that the the payoff. It is in my best interest to follow the path. Therefore, I'm going to choose X in the first period and Z in the second period. What's player two's best response? Knowing that player one will follow Z in the second period, player two's best response is to choose A and not B. And besides, um, this cannot be cannot be enforced as a second, second perfect national equilibrium. Why is that? In the second stage, we'll find because we're playing a stage game with the program, but in the first stage, there is nothing that compensates player two from playing a non-equilibrium strategy in the first stage. So to induce someone uh, not to play a stage game, Nash, Nash equilibrium, in the first stage, you have to have some compensation in the second stage. Questions? Okay. Okay, so 
So even though we said that we're not going to analyze player two strategy, we ended up analyzing player two as well. Um, player, um, player one. So given player two strategy, if player two follows the path, player one has no incentive to unilaterally deviate. Okay. So now, from two, we're going to jump to infinity. Okay. So we're going to take a look at infinitely repeated games, which is actually easier in the analysis, because the type of strategies that we're going to look at um, will be fairly intuitive. So we're going to review uh, discounting. And I realized from the questions from office hours uh, that discounting is not a straightforward concept. Okay. One way to think about it is that you know it's costly to wait. And usually we capture the economic cost or the opportunity cost of waiting by this parameter called discount factor. Okay. So the basic idea is that future payoffs are not as valuable as, as current payoffs. So um, there are different ways to express this opportunity cost. One is a uh, there's a fixed known chance of the game ending after each period. So you know this could just be everyday risk. When you drive, when you're on the highway, you know the probability that you know even even when you're a very good driver, there might be a chance that someone will hit you uh, from the back. And so so there's a a probability that, that, you know, that's it, you know, today's my last day, <laughs> okay? Um, the probability is typically very small, and, um, and we, we, um, it, we use discount factor to capture that. Another way to think about it is um, interest rate, okay? So if you put a dollar in the bank, uh, and the interest rate is 5%, uh, the next period you get a dollar and five cents. And if you want to get a dollar in the future, you have to put in, what, you put in less than a dollar. So it's one over one plus R. So this is the relationship between the three different ways of um, expressing time preferences. So delta is what we commonly use as the discount factor. Okay? And uh, one minus P, you know, the terminology discount factor is a little bit it's actually the probability that the game continues, not the probability that the game ends. And that should be the same as 1 over 1 and so on. OK, so um, what we're going to use in terms of algebra we will be using the summation of infinite series. And uh, so I'm just going to briefly review. Um, suppose you have um, a dollar today, and tomorrow is discounted by delta. Right? So you have delta tomorrow. And in period three, you have delta squared, and so on. Right? So what is this? sum of the infinite series. Um, so this is something probably we all have in high school, but uh, no one actually, if you don't use it, you probably don't um, bother to memorize the formula. OK. So this is essential. This is a little demonstration about the fact that um, you can have convergence here. So I'll, give, I'll demonstrate the reverse process. OK, so here, this is uh, one. OK, so what I'm trying to trying to demonstrate is the infinite series half plus a quarter plus an eighth plus 1 16th plus 2 to the power n and so on, OK? So we can think about the reverse process, right? So here I have unit 1, OK? And I 
take half of it off, right? That's my first term, one half, okay? And then I bend it and take another half off the remaining one. So this is what? A quarter, that's my second term, okay? Now I have a quarter left, and I'm going to take another half of what's remaining, and this is what? One eighth, right? And if I do this again, what do I get? The next term. One sixteenth. In theory, I can do this forever, okay? I can spend the rest of my life taking off pieces, and it never ends. But if you add all the bits and pieces together, what do I get? I get one, okay? So, so this is, um, essentially this is the algebra of, of adding up uh, infinite series. So let's take a look, all right? So uh, what is this? How do I know? Um, I'm just going to multiply every term by a factor of two. So I have two s on the left-hand side. One plus this term becomes a half, this term becomes a quarter, and this term becomes one eighth, and so on. And, but what is this? It's, it's my old series, so I'm going to call it s, right? So I have 2s equals 1 plus s, and what is is that right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, so S equals one, right? So that's that's my original sheet of paper, my original strip. Okay. And so this is sort of the technique that we'll use for adding up the infinite sums. So let's take a look at this thing, uh, which which essentially is adding up delta, okay, delta squared, delta cubed, and so on. Um, what I'm going to do is now I can also factor out the delta. Okay, when I factor out the delta, I also recover my original sum. And so s equals one plus delta times s. Okay, and I move the s over, uh, it becomes one minus delta. So what is s? S is one over one minus delta. Okay, so that's the uh, uh, that's how we compute. Infinite sums, and this is quite useful. Okay, so you'll be using it in computing repeat again payoffs. Okay, any questions? So let's go back and visit our uh, prison's dilemma. Okay, um, so we have two firms, they each can set low price and get split the market, get payoffs of 54, 54, or collude, set high price, not really collude, because this is non cooperative games and they're not talking to each other. And they set payoff, they get payoffs of 60, 60, or if one person sets a low price, the other person sets a high price, the one with the low price, okay, uh, take most of the market, and vice versa. So uh, what do we get? Uh, if we look at the best responses, um, if firm two sets a low price, one's best response is to go. What? Low. Low, yes. Uh, if, if two sets a high price, what's one's best response? Low. You want to undercut a little bit. And so, what do we call low? It's a dominant strategy. It's more than a best response. It's a best response regardless of what your opponent does. And that's a strong concept. We say it's a dominant strategy. And therefore, this game has a dominant strategy, national equilibrium, which is low. Okay, so for both firms to set low price. And there is at least one other, there's one other outcome that Pareto dominates the low, which is High, high, right? So that Pareto dominates the low, low because both players are better off here. Okay. But in a one shot scenario, we should not expect this to happen because um, the private incentive, and this is never a best response, the private incentive is to go uh, low, low. 
But with repetition, all sorts of good things can happen. Okay, with this, with what Axelrod calls the shadow of the future makes cooperation more likely. Okay. Um, and so we say it is a prisoner's dilemma because it has the feature that you know private rationality translates into co collective irrationality. Okay. So how do you maintain, sustain the mutually beneficial outcomes? Um, the reason we observe the dilemma is that there is no fear of punishment. You know, everybody is playing this one shot, so it's myopic. Both players are myopic. So on the firm's part, the firms do not have, if you think about this as two firms competing with each other, the firms do not have monopoly power. And we also assume that the products are homogeneous. So if one firm undercuts a little bit, well, the consumers are gone. There's no loyalty. Um, so low switching costs. And um, the consumer is actually aware of the, of the prices. So one, one way to overcome this is to explore impeded play, where right? you introduce the future. Um, and so when you have impeded encounters uh, that add uh, the uncertainty into the game. So if this is if this long-term interaction, so now we're talking about infinitely repeated games. So there's no last period, right? so you can't do backward induction, okay? Because there's no last period. So, um, but you, what you can do is to use history contingent strategies or history dependent strategies. Um, one type of strategy is called Grim Trigger. Okay, so this is a class of strategies. They're called Grim Trigger because they're very unforgiving. Okay, so the idea is people will start being cooperative. Okay, you start cooperating, and as soon as my opponent deviates once, that's it. Okay, never going to talk to you again. So I'll punish you forever. Okay, for the rest of our lives. Um, you know, you can say, well, this is this credible. Um, but, but this is one type of strategy. And what we can do is to look at whether um, you know, it can sustain cooperation if you know one of the players is a trigger player. So there are two types of trigger strategies. One is called the group trigger. So I start, both players start by cooperating. Okay. So I, I start, in particular, if I'm a group trigger player, I start the first period by cooperating, and I'll keep cooperating as long as you cooperate. And the first time you deviate, I deviate forever. That's, that's one. So, the other type of strategy, which is also used quite often, is called tip for tap. Okay. So again, if I'm a tip for tap player, I start by cooperating. Okay. Choose a cooperative strategy, and I will keep cooperating as long as you cooperate. After you deviate, if I observe the first deviation, I'm going to deviate as well. But if you come back to cooperation, I will come back to cooperation as well. So it's forgiving. Okay. Um, so essentially, I start by cooperating. And afterwards, I am just going to copy what you did in the previous period. So that's called tip. So tip for tat is very forgiving. Okay. Um, if you deviate once, I'm just going to punish you once. Okay. And it has the shortest memory because it only goes back one period once you start the game. Uh, it's proportional to the punishment. Uh, this, okay. the, the punishment is proportional to your um, to your crime. Um, we, we will analyze how credible it is. It is credible, but it's, uh, it lacks deterrence compared to grim trip. The group trigger is the least forgiving one, and it has the longest memory. If you cheat once, I will never forgive you. Okay, that is the type of strategy it is. But it is, it has adequate um, deterrence. Um, but but it's, it's sort of, in a way, it lacks credibility. So you can have two group trigger players playing each other, and you know, group trigger against group trigger is a repeated game. Okay. Um, 
But, you know, so, so usually if you talk to game theorists, people would describe a colleague's as so and so is a tip to tap. I'm wondering, has anybody encountered a good trick? A colleague or a classmate that, you know, once you cheat once or once you behave, that's it. Okay, I'm never going to talk to you again. So Carol was I, I knew one in high school, but she was bipolar. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> She Maybe that's a bigger figure, though. Okay. Yeah. What, can you explain what credible means in this context? Uh, credible means um, <coughs> whether you would actually observe someone being a tip for tat or um, being a group trigger. You know, using a group trigger strategy. If, uh, if you could declare, okay. I'm a room trigger player. Okay. What other people believe in? So this is sort of loosely speaking. I don't have a technical definition. So room trigger people are very rare in real life. Um, I, and that's my claim, okay, based on sort of the observations that I have. Um, okay. So now let's go back to um, to analyzing. Repeat again, Nash Equilibrium. Okay. So um, here's our stage. Okay. So if you cooperate, right, you choose the high price, you will get 60 today and 60 next year. If the other person also cooperates, okay, and 60 for him, right? It goes for um, So if I'm playing against. Um, Against a, a room trigger strategy, or a room trigger firm, or a room trigger play, what if I do fact? Okay. So remember, room trigger always starts by cooperating. Okay. What if I do fact today? Now, um, I'll get 72 today, which is very good. Okay. So I say, OK, we're, 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 we're in this stage where it's 60, 60, 60, 60. It's very good. And I said, gee. I am going to charge a low price, knowing that my opponent is a room trigger player. Then I get 72 today. Isn't that nice? So I get 72. Then what does room trigger do? Once he observes that, he will move to low forever. Okay. Which means you have 72 today, 54 the next period, and 54 for the rest of the horizon. So that's the two payoff streams that you can pair in uh, against. OK, so uh, this is sort of just plotting. It doesn't really look different. They're actually, one is uh, purple, the other one is blue. But uh, <laughs> they kind of look the same. The corporate is easy, right? This is the 60 forever strategy. <coughs> and if you deviate against the blue trigger, for this period, for the period that you deviate, period T, your payoff jumps up to 72, but then your know, future payoff streams will be lower every period. Okay? So the question is, how important is the future? That's when the discount factor comes in. So I'm going to um, compute, you know, when can you sustain cooperation? So how patient? go back. If the future is not important at all, if delta is zero, should you deviate against room trigger play? Uh, no. Why should I deviate when I know that um, I'm not going to be uh, But you have a payoff in this period, and you have a 72 in this period, and then it goes down to 54 tomorrow, and the day after, and so on, okay? and ever after. But the question is, how important is the future to you? It has to be sufficiently important for you not to take advantage of the payoff here. So that's what we're trying to do. So the present value, did I talk about the present value? Sure. The present value is when you have a stream of payoffs. Okay, so let's say it is. Um, so this is T, 
and this is t plus 1, t plus 2, and so on. So you pay off the sum of 2, this period, 54, next period, 54, 54, and so on. The present value is when I'm here, okay, when I'm at the present period, I look at the stream of payoffs, including today's and all the payoffs in the future, just count it back, okay? How much is it worth to So this is, this is, this is, uh, this is what the present value is. So the present value, just coming back for cooperation, you know, is 60 today, 60 forever. And how do you compute the present value of the stream of payoffs? You know, it's going to be discounted by one minus delta. This is the infinite sum. Is everybody okay with this? This is this is when we when we calculated the one plus delta plus delta square plus delta cube plus delta to the power of four and so on. Okay? So that sum is one over one plus delta. So this is how much it's worth to you. Okay. Now what if I deviate one? So the first period I receive 72, the second period I receive 54 and so on. Okay, so what is my present value? So my present value is going to be 72 plus 54 delta, okay, plus 54 delta squared, plus 54 delta cubed, and so, okay, so I'm going to factor out the 54 delta, and what I get is 1 plus delta plus delta squared, and that looks familiar, okay? What is it? So this equals 72 plus 54 delta, divided by 1 minus delta. Okay, so that's the sum. This is the present value of the deviation against the neutral. Questions? So, so now it's fairly straightforward to calculate, right? So on the left-hand side, I get 60. over 1 minus delta. Okay. And on the, so this, if I, I will cooperate against the room trigger player if the present value from cooperation is at least as large as that from deviation. And um, what is this? I can multiply every term by 1 minus delta. I get 16 greater than or equal to 72 minus 72 delta plus 54 delta. And I move these to the left hand side, this over, what do I get? I get 18 delta over the number to 4. So, what is the goal value for delta? It's 2 thirds. Yes? So, in such a game, um, when delta is less than 2 thirds, the first player who deviates is the winner? Uh, there's no loser or winner. Okay, there's a prisoner's dilemma. There's a repeated prisoner's dilemma. So, um, so one player is a room trigger player. Okay, so suppose I'm a room trigger player. Okay, and, and you know, you know that I will start cooperating, and as soon as you deviate, I'm going to deviate for the rest of the game. Uh, and you, you decide, you have to decide what to do when you encounter them, okay? 
So it's like when you first join the MSI program, you are assigned a team for your project, right? Wouldn't it be nice if, if your partner has the strategy you know? <laughs> you know, if your partner is a good trigger player, you have to decide how much effort to contribute. Whether you, it's not exactly a business dilemma, but you know, your action is a game because your payoff is affected by how much effort the rest of the team puts in. And so, uh, in this scenario, if you know I'm a good trigger player, I will put in a lot of effort. Okay? But as soon as I observe that you're slacking off, what am I going to do? I'm going to slack off forever afterwards, no matter what class, where I encounter you, I will do it. Okay? So that's, that's the type of person I am. Mean, you have to decide whether it's worthwhile um, to cheat or to put in a no effort at some point. And so if the future is not sufficiently important to you, if you say, in two years, I'm gone, <laughs> okay, and I'll never see her again, and therefore it's not so important to you, so your delta is very low, okay? Um, in that case, uh, cooperation with this payoff matrix okay, is not sustainable. Okay, you will want to cheat. Whereas if the future is sufficiently important, you say, well, you know, in two years we'll both graduate, but you know, I might meet her again. I might need a letter of recommendation, or she might come to my company to give a talk, <laughs> or something, right? There's some chance of future encounter. You might say, let me just play this, okay? Um, and of course, I believe that you all are very nice people. You don't have to go through the strategic calculation of that. <laughs> but this is essentially the calculus of, of cooperation. Again, if you know the other person is Yeah, go ahead. Does that answer your question? Uh, one more question. Yeah. If delta is less than two thirds, yes. The first player to deviate will have the uh, more pair forever. Right, right. So, so, um, so it's better essentially, the player who deviates against the blue trigger. Okay, so if, if I'm a, um, when you're playing against the blue trigger strategy, right, and if you cooperate always, you have equal payoffs. Okay. If you deviate, you your payoff is always going to be higher than your the group trigger. Okay. Um, the question is whether it's worthwhile for you. If the is less than two thirds, it's worth. If it's less than two thirds in this scenario, it's not. It's it's, it's you, you will just deviate. Yeah. So because the the future is not important enough for you to forgo the current payoff, the payoff term in one period. Okay, any other questions? Okay, what about tit for tat? As we mentioned, uh, tit for tat is very forgiving. Um, so again, you're in this payoff stream of 60 forever if you cooperate against a tit for tat player. And if you deviate once, okay, you'll get a payoff jump of 72, but the next period the tit for tat player will punish you, but only once, okay. So she's going to punish you and bring your payoff down to 47, and then you say, okay, I'm going to cooperate again, okay. And then but she, she will also start cooperating. So tit for tat, if you, pun if you deviate once, I will punish you once. And then I'll just copy your strategy from the previous one. You can also deviate forever, and that's not very interesting because we're back to the analysis of the group trigger. Okay, so let's take a look at um, the same, the same uh, set of analysis, okay? So if you cooperate forever, your payoff is going to be um, 60, 60, 60, and forever, right? And um, if you deviate once, okay, 
the period you deviate, you get a boost of payoff of 7 to 2, and the next period you get a punishment, so your fixed payoff is brought down to 47. But then that's it, that's the end of punishment. And you're back into the 60, 60 forever stream. Okay? So when I'm comparing these two streams of payoffs, uh, the 60, 60 forever is not very interesting. I can just cancel them out from both sides. Okay? Yes? So I'm just curious about the payoff for the yeah. So it's 72 to 47. Is there a reason that if you play low, and that 72, why would you necessarily play high next time so you can get it on? Is there a reason you would just play like, and this is the low? You play low, and, I mean, like, is it, when a player one plays low, yeah. and the other player tries to cooperate, that's when you get 72. Yes. Is, is there a reason you wouldn't then preempt them to protect you by then, then playing low by playing low yourself so you go down to 54 and then revert to cooperate? Um, it's because, okay, so suppose that I'm the tip for tap. Sure. Okay. It, it, you can write down an algorithm to program the strategy, which is I start by cooperating, and then after the first period, I will always copy the strategy okay. from the previous period. So if you deviate in period T, oh, okay. I will deviate okay. in period T plus 1, and then if you only deviate once, in period T plus 1, you will be cooperating, and then I'm back cooperating one period later. Okay. Yeah. Um, does that make sense? OK, so uh, I can still do the brute force way of computing the infinite sum, but it's not necessary. So the only relevant periods is the two periods, where uh, I'm, I'm being punished. Okay. So in the two periods, if I don't deviate, I get 60 this period, and 60 the next period, this time with the delta. And if I deviate, I get 72 this period, but the next period I get 47 with the discount of the delta. So I can forget about the future 60s because they're not different. Okay. So now I'm basically solving this inequality. And what do I get? I get 60, the difference between 60 and 47 is 13, okay, 13 delta, and this is as we go in 12. And what is delta? Delta has to be at least 12, 13. Which means that people have to be what? Very efficient. Your discount factor is almost one which means that the future is almost as important to you as today. So this is when we say, well, people are, if people are endowed with all sorts of discount factors, this is harder to satisfy than the room children. Okay? It needs a strict, this condition is strict. So we say it's harder to sustain cooperation using tip for tap than using children. So in a way, the consequence of deviating from group trigger is so severe that I have to think very carefully. Whereas the consequence of deviating, defecting against a typical tablet is not so severe. Okay, I get punished once, but then I'm back. Oh, okay, I'm not so Back to being nice. Questions? So um, these two strategies are very well known, um, partly because they're two extremes. Okay, um, brain sugar is um, has has adequate punishment, whereas tit for tat essentially is too lenient. If you're too lenient, um, you maybe just might not have sufficient deterrence for misbehavior. And if you think about grim trigger, it's you know it's it's just uh, the, the consequences are very severe. Okay. So there's a trade-off between deterrence and credibility. 
Um, and there's some work, very, very well known, uh, work by Professor Bob Acheron at the Ford School, um, and then to the science. So he wrote a book called The Evolution of Cooperation, uh, which is one of the most well known game theoretic books. It's very thin, okay, um, paperback, which I read in graduate school. So it uh, essentially summarizes a, uh, a set of simulations that he conducted in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, and so essentially he asked game theorists to submit strategies, to game strategies. At the time, we don't actually know much about you know, solutions or um, you know, what, what strategy is, is most effective uh, in promoting cooperation when you're against a lot of different players. Okay, so, so this is, you know, you are, typically we are a pretty stable type. Okay, we're either very cooperative or not so cooperative. Or we really, you know, hammer people hard and punish, or we're very good. Okay, there's people coming in all sorts of shapes. And so when you go to graduate school, and then you go for job interviews, and then you move to all sorts of people, you can think of what kind of strategy stable strategies will survive and do well in all these different kinds of encounters. So his simulation essentially tried to capture that idea in an empirical way. So he uh, asked game theorists to submit strategies, and he just ran a tournament. So the pairs of strategies meet each other, and you play the prisoner's game. Okay. Um, and then we just observe your payoff. So you, someone observed, I think Iman observed that if you play against the room trigger, you will always do at least as well as the room trigger. Okay. Um, and sometimes better. So, so the issue is, you know, which strategy will do well against a whole set of different strategies, a whole host of different strategies. These strategies are not stupid. Okay. They are submitted by people who study strategies. So I, I think it's the winner in the first round is tip for tap. Okay, it's a very simple strategy. Um, and the reason is it's forgiving. Okay, it's nice. And it is provocable. Okay, so if you punish, if you deviate, I will punish you. Okay, and if you keep deviating, I will keep punishing you. Okay, so if you, can, if you look at the relative payoff, okay, um, it's not going to do as bad as, as you should. And it's very clear, it's very simple. And so after the first round, lots of people said, well, that can't be. Tip for tap is too simple. So what if we have tip for two taps, tip for three taps, you know, we have strategies which are much more complex. If you deviate once, I'll punish you twice in a row. Right? So, right. so they said, let's do it for another round. And then so he solicited strategies for another round. This time, everyone knows the tip for tap was the winner for the first round. Okay, so lots of strategies were designed to essentially um, beat to the tap. And so what's the outcome of the second round? Anybody knows? Yes. Is it tip for two taps? No, no, it's tip to the tap. It's still tip to the tap. Okay. So it's a very simple strategy, but it's very robust against a lot of different strategies. Wouldn't the very interest who submitted strategies have known that they were going to get beat by tip for tap in advance of the simulation? Um, they should. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they should. Um, and yet, so, right, so, so, you know, the strategies, have, there should be an archive of all the strategies. But the book is, is, is enjoyable. Okay, so tip for tap is actually very successful. So, uh, okay, so this is just, <laughs> don't be too covered, which means that if you have submitted a strategy that's very elaborate, you know, have multiple states, um, you don't necessarily. Okay. So there's several nice things about tip to tap, which is don't be envious, don't be the first to cheat, reciprocate via opponent's behavior, and, and you know, don't be too covered. Okay, so, um, so we, I'm 
hoping we will still have time to actually summarize sort of the, the repeated game strategies. Um, and this example is exactly the same as before. I changed the payout vectors because I want a very nice graph. Right? So if both defect, I'm going to give them payout of 0, 0, and everything is benchmarked against that. Um, so this is from Watson. So if we take a look uh, in this payoff matrix, okay, uh, one cooperation can be sustained by room sugar, we can look at cooperation will generate the payoff stream of four forever, so it's four over one minus delta, and room sugar will get six in the period of function, zero afterwards, right? So you're going to compare four over one minus delta, which is cooperative forever, with six because always defect is zero zero, so that's very easy. So in this case, delta just need to be above one. Third. Um, I'm also going to go through a strategy which is called modified grim trigger. Okay, this is uh, an example from Watson, and. Um, it involves automation, and the reason I go through this is because one of the homework assignments um, asks you to look at modified function. And so let's say that the players alternate between cooperate and cooperate and defect cooperate over time. But they start to assist. And if either or both deviate to the ordinating strategy, deviate from the strategy, they'll both revert to D. So the question is, can something that's a little more sophisticated, uh, like this, alternating between two strategies, be sustained as a set in perfect mesh equilibrium? So let's take a look at the payoff matrix. So we start with CC, that gives us a payoff of 4, 4, and we're going to alternate between CC and DC. So, um, so we're basically jumping between these two sides, and the question is whether we can actually sustain it. Um, notice that neither is an actual equilibrium. So we're basically doing this. We start here, and then we go back here. So this is called the modified room trigger. And the issue is if one of us or both of us deviate, if one of us deviate, we're just going to come to deviate forever. Okay. Oh, yeah, it works. Okay. The algebra is a little ugly because we, it involves ordination. So your chaos differs from round to round. Okay. So, uh, pair two plays room trip, modified room trip. Uh, one also plays modified room trip. What is the present value for pair one? So we call it PB underscore one. Um, and this, the substrate here is for pair one. Okay. So pair one strategy is between four when we're playing CC and six when we're playing DC. So it's this 4, 6, 4, 6, forever. So what I'm going to do is to collect all the four terms. And then I collect all the six terms. Okay. Um, and this looks familiar, but it looks a little different. Okay. Uh, if we have 1 plus delta plus delta squared plus delta cubed, we know what to do. And but now what we can do is we can just treat delta squared as the old delta. And then that just going to look the same. So okay, so let me um, 
So one plus delta squared plus delta uh, four plus delta to the power eight. So I can just rewrite it as one plus d plus d squared plus d cubed. And I know that that equals one over one minus d. And then I'm just substituting the delta square of that. So, so this equals one over one minus d squared. And what I do here is let d equals d. So this is a, a substitution that I use for these type of alternating strategies. So what we get here is 4 over 1 minus delta squared, and here we get 6 delta over 1 minus delta squared. So we can compute the present values of the Present value will be exactly the first expression. The first expression. You mean the present, this one? Yeah. What about it? What was your question? Uh, the the uh, present value of player one. Yes, this is the present value of player one from playing the alternating strategy. Okay. From playing the modified game trick, when player two is also following. And we can compute the two's present value, which is 4 minus 2 delta plus 4 delta squared, and so on. Again, we want to collect all the similar terms. We factor out 4. And then we factor out the 2 delta. And then again, we're back to 1 over 1 minus delta squared. And so this time it's 4 minus 2 delta. Odd, even, odd, even, odd, even. Okay. 
player of two deviates in an odd number period, the payoff goes from four to six in this period, and zero ever after. And in an even number period, the payoff is going to be zero ever after. <coughs> zero in this round and zero ever after. Why ever after? I mean, well, because part of the prescription is called modified is that we'll alternate, but if one of us deviates, we're just going to deviate. So that's the root trigger. Okay, so the root trigger strategy that we talked about before um, is to say that if you deviate, okay, we're going to play defect, defect forever. And this one says, so, so the first prisoner's dilemma, we say, we'll cooperate, we'll always cooperate, but if you defect once, I will punish you forever. We're just going to go into the DD forever. Okay. Whereas this one says, we're going to alternate. This is the prescription between CC and DC. And if one of us defect any time, we're going to play DD forever. So that's the uh, modified picture. So, um, it's a little surprising to me that, um, that the delta is still so high. And relatively high um, for sustaining the, the, that strategy. It seems like the um, sticker would be more, like people would be less likely to stick to it. Um, delta high meaning it's less likely to sustain. No, um, doesn't doesn't the first doesn't this that statement mean that um, it can be supported as a sudden perfect match equilibrium as long as basically people value have a high high value for the future? Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. But I mean that's a compared to some of the other thing other values of delta we look at that's relatively. Why? Delta is game specific. Okay. So you have to look at this particular game payoff and okay. say, what does it take to sustain a given trigger in this one point? Okay. So it is game specific. Okay, so we are not done. Uh, we will continue. Next, on Thursday, we'll talk about the folk theory. And this week's uh, state seminar is actually about repeated games, okay. cooperation and so I'm going to, it's, it's in the last page of the